Welcome to our class on nonlinear control. Um, so let's uh, go back to where we were. Um, we had started talking about uh, feedback linearization, all right, and we were actually doing a couple of. Uh, of course, I mean we introduced some notation, yeah, which probably was a little bit complicated, but then uh, we also did an example. So hopefully, uh, you know, there's a little bit of clarity and I also hope that some of you did go back and actually try to look through this material. I posted it already on Moodle. Yeah. So the lectures are already on there. So this is what I've been using and I plan to use subsequently also. All right. So, uh, so the only two real notations and then of course extended versions of this, there is the lead derivative. Uh, which is basically the derivative, the directional derivative of a scalar valued function along a vector field. And then there was the Lie bracket, which basically takes two vector fields and gives you a sort of a sort of a skew symmetric operation. Yeah, it's like a, a DGF minus DFG, yeah, this kind of an operation. And then there was of course the add notation, which is basically just a, a different way of writing iterated Lie brackets. Right. Um, we had used this to of course look at systems of this form uh, with output which looks like this and we want to sort of uh, come up with this uh, diffeomorphism, this transformation. Uh, if so, if you remember the feedback linearization has two pieces, there is a state linearization or a state transformation and there is a feedback which, uses, which is then finally used to linearize the system. Okay. Or make the system look linear yeah I wouldn't say linearize yeah so so the idea is you just take successive derivatives of this output yeah and you try to see in which derivative the input shows up and that's called the relative degree yeah and that is basically qualified with this sort of expression yeah because as you take derivatives uh, of y the time derivatives of y you will start seeing the dynamics again and again and again right and that's what happens you have uh, y is h and then you have the first derivative is lfh if you assume that the you know that that lgh is 0 right similarly the second derivative is becomes lf squared h if you assume that lg lfh is 0 and so on and so forth yeah and this does happen because you assumed relative degree r so this happens until k equal to r minus 2 okay after that you get something non zero all right. So notice that we are still working with a um, scalar valued control. Okay, this is a single input system. Yeah, the ideas again work for the multi input case, but just things just become a little bit more complicated. Yeah, so easier to work here with a single input case. Okay, all right. So, uh, so that's the idea. We essentially try to compute the relative degree by seeing how many derivatives of the output you need to get to the input. Right, and we then say sort of say that this is how uh, this is the part of the dynamics that you can actually linearize by a feedback okay so this r the dynamics of size r is what you can linearize so it's like a partial feedback linearization and the rest of it is some additional dynamics okay so in order to get to this sort of nice linear sort of structure we need a few inequalities that is in order to verify that these things this y equal to h its derivative its second derivative they do form new coordinates we need some uh, equalities the first one basically said that uh, if you have these quantities to be zero that is lgh lglf lglf square all the way to lglfk to be zero then it's equivalent to saying that lg l add fg l add kg all the way is zero okay these two are equivalent Okay, so and the key, um, the very very key identity that we use to prove all of this is basically this guy. Okay, this is what you need. All right, this is what you need. So, uh, so I can even highlight this. Yeah, yeah. So this is really what you will require. 
to in order to complete all of this proof we actually looked at the proof okay so once you have that this sort of an iterated relationship yeah um, there is an equality that is between lg lfk to l add fk g yeah there is a similarity here there is an equivalence here you can actually um, start talking about independence of these vectors okay what are these vectors this is just the jacobian corresponding to this new coordinates that is the new coordinates are h lfh all the way to this lfr minus 1h okay and so if you take the d which is just the partial you get a jacobian structure all right so because dh is a row vector dlfh is a row vector so you essentially get you know a jacobian and we used uh, we want to prove that we wanted to prove that this is linearly independent okay these r row vectors are in fact linearly independent and how did we do that we did that by looking at the multiplication of this guy with some other vector okay which was very smartly chosen okay why was it smartly chosen because once i do the multiplication here we actually did it very carefully right once i do the multiplication here you can see that um, every row basically just uh, contains you know things like this this guy right and then this guy and so on and so forth so basically you start seeing a lower triangular structure all right why this is because of the first equality that we proved okay this is just coming from the first equality right in this case you have this last term to be non zero in the second row you have last two terms to be non zero and so on and so forth so you have a lower triangular form all right and it's well known that the lower triangular form whatever is the number of non zero rows is the rank okay so the product of this matrix these two matrices is an r by r matrix and we have proven that the r by r matrix has rank r okay which means individually each of these guys also have to have rank r right and therefore these are linearly independent and these are also linearly independent okay so we simultaneously proved that all of these are in fact linearly independent okay all right so this is where we were yeah uh, of course with the linear independence you once you have this linear independence you can construct this change of coordinates right and since this gives me only r number of coordinates i actually add a few more what is how many more n minus r more because i started with an n dimensional uh, you know uh, state space so i have to go to another n dimensional state space so i have this r and then i have this n minus r where these phi are simply chosen to make sure that this whole map phi capital phi is a diffeomorphism okay which essentially means that uh, the jacobian is invertible okay has to be an, has to have an invertible jacobian right uh, so that is essentially what it this says this guy has full rank okay yeah full rank means invertible in this case yeah because you can see that phi is it's n dimensional x is also n dimensional so when i take the jacobian it's an n by n matrix right so full rank means it's an invertible matrix so del phi del x or d phi however you want to write it is supposed to be an invertible matrix now in order to help with that we already know that this the jacobian of this is invertible or or full rank sorry not invertible in this case maximal rank right why because of the lemma for 0.2 and zema 0.2 basically just said that that this is maximal rank or this is rank r if these rows are rank r then obviously the jacobian of this is exactly this guy right and that's also rank r okay so this helps us obviously so lemma 0.2 is what helps us in claiming that these are in fact independent coordinates this is what it means for the coordinates to be independent i mean we are not used to i mean we are not used to this because we just say that x1 x2 x3 are our coordinates and we think they are independent yes because they are in orthogonal frames right so we never think about it but now if i transform this x1 x1 x2 x3 non linear to some other function other three functions okay say i say x1 square plus x2 square minus x3 square x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square x1 square minus x2 square plus x3 square i just gave you some non linear transformation now what is the guarantee that these new coordinates are in fact coordinates that is they are linearly independent okay the only way to claim that is by checking the jacobian okay you have to take the d5 okay 
and then you have to see that it is full rank right and if it is you are good and that's really what we are trying to do so because of these are independent coordinates because it gives me maximal rank not full rank in this case but maximal rank so all i have to do is to make sure that the d phi of these that is partials of these are also linearly independent okay that's it okay and we actually looked at an example right this dc motor example right what did we do we um, we actually verified both the lemmas right first is this equality lemma which is basically saying that you know this uh, lg lf and lg lf all the way to lg lf r minus 2 is 0 which means that you want to prove that l add f r minus 1 is 0 okay sorry l add f r minus 2 is 0 okay and that's what we did uh, uh, basically it's easy to see that l add f k is 0 in this case because what does r turn out to be what was the relative degree of the system the relative degree was just 2 it was very simple we just we did all the computations what did we do we computed lg lf first we computed lgh it was 0 then we computed lfh which was theta x1 x2 then we computed lg lfh which was theta x2 hmm? so this itself came out to be non zero right so this is just the first power so so basically you have r equal to 2 right because this 1 is equal to r minus 1 so r is basically equal to 2 okay so we got relative degree 2 right and so all we had to prove was that l add of 0 gh is equal to 0 and that's what we proved it's very easy already done yeah so lemma for 0 0.1 was easy to, easy to prove then we wanted to look at the rank of uh, you know the lemma 0 0.2 which is basically saying that the h and lfh which are our new coordinates so in this case h is uh, basically your uh, x3 and lfh is theta x1 x2 these are the two new coordinates right and we wanted to see if their jacobian has maximal rank so we computed that right we actually computed the jacobian it is dh is 0 0 1 because x h is x3 right and then LFH is theta x1 x2, so DLFH is basically this guy. And for this to be maximal rank, we just need for x1 x2 to be non zero. Okay. Then the way we chose our phi, that is the third coordinate, was just to make sure that I get a full rank Jacobian. Okay. And what did I recommend? I well, I thought I I just thought I'll make the third row orthogonal to the second row. Because this first and the second row are already orthogonal, notice, because the dot product of first and second is 0 already, right. So the first and second are already orthogonal. So I just made sure that the second and third are orthogonal. So to do that, I chose this sort of a y3, right. So everything looks non-linear. And of course, now I know that if x1, x2 is not equal to 0, 0, then this is a full rank matrix, right. So I'm good to go. This is a valid new set of coordinates, hmm? valid new set of coordinates, okay. The other choice which I had sort of used earlier was taking the third coordinates as x, x2 minus b, right. In that case, I would have got 0, 1, 0, right, actually I have written it here, yeah. Corresponding to this, I would get the third row as 0, 1, 0, yeah. This is fine too. The only problem is in this case, we saw that you need x2 to be non zero for this to be uh, full rank yeah if x2 is zero then you see that the second and third rows are exactly the same on it and that's a problem okay so if x2 is non zero all of this works no problem this new coordinate also works huh? there is value in looking at this we we'll look at we'll see this immediately subsequently okay uh -huh. Uh, all right so now Great, we now are in a position to sort of talk about the transformed system. What does it look like? Hmm? So if you look at this, you know, this sort of new representation or new variables in which we are writing the dynamics, okay, and you start computing the derivatives, right? Right, you start computing these derivatives. Uh, this is basically, uh, um, well, I mean, this is written in terms of this guy, right? That is, Z is basically looked upon as all these coordinates these new coordinates are just written as z i used y that's not a big deal okay all right so this is just writing in terms of the capital phi this is not very useful to us just look at this part okay z1 is basically the actual output 
of the system. So, Z1 dot is actually LFH has to be because LGH is 0 that is how we have been doing right and that is equal to Z2 itself because Z2 is LFH. Now, if you take the derivative again of Z2 it is DDT LFH, but that is going to be LF squared H because again LG LFH is 0 right. This is again how we have got the relative degree right. This is by the relative degree assumption right. So, therefore, you have Z2 dot is LF square H which is Z3 okay. And you can keep on going like this you essentially form an integrator a chain of integrators okay. Z1 dot is Z2, Z2 dot is Z3 and so on and so forth until you get to ZR dot right which is now the last coordinate this guy. Now, when I take the derivative of this I will get what L f r h plus L g L f r minus 1 h right just by taking the standard derivative right and plugging in the dynamics ok. Now, you know that this is not 0 because of our again relative degree r assumption right. So, I am going to write this as some b z plus a z u where a z is not 0. Okay. So, that is what the linear part looks like right. It is just a bunch of integrators and then the final state has some nonlinearity in its derivatives ok. So, notice I started with a nonlinear system which was nonlinear everywhere right in all the states probably yeah just like in the DC motor case. But now I have because of my state transformation I have reached a stage where I actually have linear integrators everywhere and only in the start last state there is a nonlinearity, but I will just define this as my new input v right and that is possible because u is actually v minus b divided by a and a is non-zero right. Therefore, I can do this assignment from v I can compute u no problem there is no singularity issue or anything because a is non-zero by my relative degree assumption ok. Therefore, I just had a chain of integrators here. So, this is the partial linearization that we have achieved ok. You cannot do anything more whatever is the relative degree of your output that is the best you can do. If you can find an output for which your relative degree is n then this entire thing will look like a bunch of integrators ok. I hope that is clear that if relative degree is equal to n then this is just all going to be looking like a bunch of integrators ok. So, you have effectively completely linearized the system ok all right great. Now, uh, for the rest of the dynamics uh, if we assume that the phi's ok uh, until now the the way we were choosing phi was just to ensure that you got a diffeomorphism that is you got Jacobian full rank which is what we did here right. We just gave a row which sort of made sure that you know this is a full rank Jacobian and from that I went back and constructed a the additional phi states right. But here we are saying suppose I have another assumption on phi that in the phi dynamics the control does not show up ok. So, that is the assumption. So, that is what is the normal form if control does not appear in phi i dot ok. If the control does not appear in phi i dot equations then and that is how you choose the phi which means what does it mean? It means that L g phi i x is equal to 0 because that is the way control will not appear right because this is the control vector field right. If I take phi i dot I get L f phi i plus L g phi i times control right. So, if L g phi i is 0 then no control appears in the phi equations right and so, with such choice of phi's if you wrote this dynamics you have what is called the normal form ok. And uh, the DDT phi i is L f phi i and we just call it q i z because q i is just a new notation because now we are writing in terms of the new variables z that is all alright. So, what do I have then in the normal form? In the normal form I again have this bunch of integrators that does not change here control does not appear anymore ok. Control does not appear here because I choose the phi's in a smart way right. So, that phi dot does not have the control alright does that make sense ok. Now, uh, 
if you go back now to our example okay you look at this choice of y1 y2 and then y1 y2 is what they are we can't really play with them yeah we chose this guy what is y3 dot this guy yeah but control appears in that equation right so this choice of transformations does not give me the normal form okay does not give me the normal form it just gives me a linearized form but it's not the normal form usually in feedback linearization uh, control theorists prefer to work with the normal form why because it's just nice right you you have a nonlinear system right whatever nonlinearity is there are but there's no control in that but then you have a linear system sort of driving this nonlinear system all right and this driving system is linear okay so you can do a lot of things with the driving system right remember again with the cas go back to the cascade idea right there was a driving system or a driven system so here this will become the driving system and the output of this will go to this guy because we will look at it how that happens yeah but the point is there is nonlinearities here with no control and then there is this linearity here where you can control these states very well basically you can make sure these states do whatever you want yeah because it's linear and has a very nice structure okay so this is the normal form what i'm trying to say is what we chose as y3 does not get us to the normal form this on the other hand gives us the normal form why because if you look at z3 dot okay what is z3 dot z3 dot is just x2 dot right what was x2 dot no control no control in x2 dot okay so but remember this was a restrictive choice right because this was a valid choice only when x2 is non zero okay this is a valid transformation only if x2 is non zero okay so it's a slightly more restrictive choice here we had the freedom of having either x1 or x2 non zero anything being non zero was good enough for here but here no we definitely need x2 to be non zero but although this is a restrictive choice it still gives us the normal form okay which is why this is also an important sort of uh, transformation i think that's what i wrote here yeah this this transformation for the dc motor system is what gives you the normal form okay it gives you z1 dot is z2 z2 dot is this guy and z3 dot is this no control here notice the control doesn't appear here okay all right so that's how you do it you get to the normal form in addition to trying to get to a diffeomorphism you make sure that the in the derivative of the extra states or the phi states the control doesn't appear all right so that is how you get to the normal form all right uh, so now you have essentially what is called a partially linearized system yeah because like i said with this choice of v you have the z1 to zr states being a linear system right just bunch of integrators actually not any linear system but a very specific linear system and then you have a bunch of non linear systems all right we'll see what can be done in these cases yeah how to control in these cases uh, but before we do that we want to um, uh, talk i mean define the notation of a zero dynamics right so we we are denoting by psi these partially linearized states which is z1 to zr and by eta the rest of the states okay just for notation sake so the psi dot system is again in this form integrator form right so in this integrator form yeah uh, so and the eta system is some non linear form right we don't know what it is but it is some non linearity the only thing that we know is because of it's a normal form the control doesn't appear right so it is some function of psi and eta so what we have done is we have split the z states into psi and eta states okay so i have split the z states into the psi states and the eta states that's all yeah the psi states correspond to the linear part 
and the eta correspond to the non-linear part. Yeah. Now, suppose that the output is identically zero, then all its derivatives are also identically zero, right? Which means psi is identically zero. Okay. Uh, what this does to the uh, psi dynamics or the whatever I mean the way so if you look at the zr dynamics so zr dot is also zero okay and that essentially is equal to this guy I mean you're just plugging in psi equal to zero in this right hand side yeah No, because uh, this is this can be, this is depending on all the states. Huh? See if you go back here. Let's go back here. Huh? All this entire state, right? A entire Z. I can't control that. That is coming from all this LFH and LGH. Yeah, that you can't control. It is not just depending on these states. Yeah, it can depend on both. So all I'm doing is I'm splitting the Z into these two pieces. Hmm? All right. Right. So, um, anyway, this is anyway too much detail to get to the basic point. The basic point is that what you call the zero dynamics is when psi is zero here. Okay. This is remember this is the nonlinear part, and if you put psi equal to zero here, what you get is the zero dynamics. Okay. Why um, this is of interest? Why this is of value? Is because this psi system is the linear system right the assumption is that i can do anything with it so i can even drive it to zero as fast as i want so if you remember uh, even in the cascade case right what did we say that we had a stable system which is being which is an additive term which is the which is basically coming out of a passive system which is the output of a passive system so we were putting a, a nonlinear uh, stable system in uh, cascade with a right you had this guy so here what did you have you had a stable system here right and you had in addition to it this basically this y guy that was coming out of a passive system right so it's very similar to that here if i make this zero right that was the whole idea right if y is zero right then this system is just z dependent and this is a stable system right but if but we also know that i can do nice things with y because of passivity in this case in this case it was passivity and that is what is driving this system so similarly you have this idea that this psi states not passive in this case but they are basically a linear system coming from a linear system so the assumption is i can do whatever i want with it therefore it is important to actually study the zero dynamics that is what happens or how does this system, the nonlinear system, behave when the linear part goes away or decays or dies down to zero? What happens? Okay, and that's important. All right. Okay. <laughs>